number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. I'm Patrick Cristiano, your host, the publisher of TheaterLife.com, a website for theater buffs covering everything theater. And I have a really special guest, an exciting guest, a Tony Award winning producer, Daryl Roth. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you. Daryl, you have the distinction of bringing seven Pulitzer Prize winning plays to Broadway, to the theater, not to Broadway. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I am so excited to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you. Well, it's I, nice to be here. We've yeah. been friends for years. Yeah, so well, this I, is a very nice, kind of relaxed way to talk. How kind of you to come. Thank you so much for doing it. And I am thrilled because you have brought the first production back to New York. A production of a show from a, a play from the... Don Mayer Warehouse in Don London. Don Warehouse in London. And you, you just saw, you, you read a review? I read a review in the New York Times when it opened. And the beauty of this particular piece of theater is that it's very creative, very innovative, and there are no actors. You hear the story through these amazing headphones as told by Juliet Stevenson. And so... Juliet's amazing. Let's, sh let's show them the video. So, so yeah, a little and bit then of, we'll talk. Because we, we have a promo video of what they put together. Uh, and you'll learn so much just from this. Let's have it. Hi, I'm Daryl Roth, and I am so happy to welcome you back to our beautiful theater on Union Square. I know we've all yearned to once again gather together after this most challenging year. And we're so grateful to be one of the first venues chosen to reopen and safely offer you that opportunity. We are so proud to present the U.S. premiere of the critically acclaimed Dunmar Warehouse production of Blindness. This meaningful and timely story will unfold around you through headphone technology and a surrounding atmosphere of light and design in a socially distanced manner. This will allow us to return to a shared experience in a protected and secure way. Our first priority is keeping you, our audience, and our staff safe and healthy. We are able to open our doors by complying with the guidelines set forth by the City and the State of New York. There will be a limited number of tickets sold, with ample time in between showings for cleaning. All tickets will be sold in advance online and in pairs at the price of a comparable single off-Broadway ticket. So two people in a social bubble can be seated in a pod, six feet away from other pods. Through the purchase of your ticket, we will be able to adhere to contact tracing protocols for our visitors. Prior to arrival, all patrons will be emailed a health questionnaire to complete. When you arrive at the theater, you will be greeted by our house staff, all of whom have COVID safety training. They will take your temperature and ensure everyone is screened according to CDC guidelines. The venue will open 10 minutes before each showing to help us avoid crowding. For your safety, our restrooms will be restricted and we encourage you to use your own facilities prior to your arrival. There will be no concessions or merchandise available and coat check will remain closed. All guests and staff are required to wear approved face masks at all times. Hand sanitizer will be available in the lobby of the theater, and there will be easy to see directional signage. We have enhanced our ventilation system, which will bring more fresh outdoor air into the venue and disinfect recirculated air. At your seat, you will find the sanitized wireless headphones waiting for you. After the 70 minute performance, you will be guided safely out of the venue. For more information, we encourage you to visit our website, where you will find our detailed safety plan. We're glad you're going to be joining us, and with everyone doing their part to keep one another safe and healthy, brighter days are surely ahead. Wonderful. So, so it's based on a 1995 Pulitzer Prize winning novel by Jose Saramango. Uh, it's, it was wonderful. I, I ha <laughs> took my breath away. Well, it's, um, 
it's actually, the book itself, um, written by Jose Saramago, as you say, um, is kind of a, a dystopian story. You know, it's, uh, it's been called brilliantly terrifying, actually. And it is. And it about, is. It and, really and is. And it is, but it's uh, cathartic and hopeful at the end. And it takes you through this journey of a rather serious epidemic that befalls a city. And the only person who is, uh, remains sighted is the wife of the doctor. And it is that character that Juliet Stevenson plays and tells the story to us through this amazing sound design that she people can't get over. Not just the sound design, her performance. Yes. The sound design was like amazing. amazing, too. I'm, I'm ben and Max, what's their name? Do you know their name? By yeah, Ben and Max, they did a beautiful job with the sound. And the way she recorded it, the sound is all around. And so you, you feel as though she's talking to you right on your shoulder. Well, and you feel like she's you're whispering in your ear in some like of the whispering moments. in your ear. I mean, when people, you feel the sounds of the city, you think people are walking right in front of you. But there are no actors in it, which takes us back to why I was able to do it during this time. And so when I read about it at the Dunmar Warehouse, I realized they had presented this during COVID. And so I was so anxious to get our theater open. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much for being a person to do that. <laughs> uh, it felt good. We waited for the city and the state to approve everything. I mean, as you could see from the video, we are so safe. We are so sanitized. We are and I've been, clean air. I can attest how safe it was. Yes. I felt safe, you know. That's the good thing. People are now comfortable gathering. And the more people that get vaccinated, of course, the happier they are to come out and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, be mm -hmm. with other people in a theater and hear a story being told. And so it's been very exciting. It, it uh, has been open since April 2nd. And, and it's been getting really good reviews. It's been getting wonderful reviews. People are um, talking about it. It feels good to see something and then gather and talk about what you just saw. You know, we haven't had that. We've all been so isolated for so long mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that I think part of the joy of this is, yes, the story is brilliant. It's a communal thing that we get to do. That's right. We're back once more again. That's right. Having kind of contact yes. with people and yes. interacting about something that's important to us. Yeah. And Jose Saramago is a Nobel laureate. I mean, this is a book that a lot of people knew about. And I must admit, I did not know about the book. But people know the story. And so when you see it and feel it come to life, the sound is great, but the lighting design is amazing. And you're sitting very safely in your own little pod of two seats together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you feel, uh, you feel the intimacy of the storytelling. And, and, and Simon Stevens directed it, who did the Curious he Incident? He did the adaptation. Oh, okay. He did the adaptation, and it's quite brilliant. You know, the book itself is a huge volume, and, and our show lasts only 70 minutes, which is another good thing that people are grateful for, because as they come in very safely and they're seated, mm -hmm. they enjoy this experience, and then they leave. And so there's no gathering. Again, it's not a question of, uh -huh. again, thinking about the COVID safety, I mean. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it worked out well. My theater was the reason that I was able to do it because you know it's a very flexible space and we can configure the seating in whatever way. Um, most recently um, we had this wonderful in and of itself which played in the theater and that wanted to be very intimate so they had 150 seats. We've also had Della Guarda in Ferza Bruto where we've had people flying all over and we've had 400 people in mm -hmm. the space. Um, Peter Dinklage did a production of Cyrano in the space, and we had Hannah Gadsby. So we do a multitude of things, all very interesting, all very unique. And you always reconfigure the space to, and we to always do reconfigure. Now, but, but this time, initially, you had to be restricted to 86 seats. Correct. But has that changed now? No. We are still doing 86 seats. The only thing that has changed, we've added more shows. People are enjoying it, so we now have... Uh, during the week, we have a show at 5, at 7, and at 9 on the weekend. And we have a 3 o'clock show on Wednesday. And during the weekend, we added 1 o'clock shows. So that while we can only have 86 people in the space at right. one time, and that's governed by the city and the state, so that we have our social distancing. Mm -hmm. I, I just thought maybe they had changed it a little bit since they were open. Not for our space. Oh, okay. Not for our space. But so we've added other shows, multiple mm -hmm. shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's been good. Now, when you, when you, when you, you just make a call to the Donner Warehouse? Is that what you do? I did. <laughs> I called them and I said, I read this wonderful review, and I have a very similar space to yours. And we had 
you know, I know the people that run the theater right, there. Of course. And so we had a conversation and I said, would you be interested in having blindness presented in New York? And they said, we would love it. We would love that. Oh, wow. And I said, well, I would like to do it. I think I can do it in my space, awesome. which lends itself. <laughs> And so then they said, would you like to have the rights to do it in other cities as well? I said, yes. Wow. I would. So we're starting it in New York, and then our plan is to license it to other cities, and there's a great deal of interest oh, wow. from Los Angeles, Chicago. Um, there is another production in Washington, D.C. that's not part of our family, um, but uh, there's a Mexico City production. So we're excited about it because it's something that theaters can open now. Mm -hmm. while we wait for the time that we yearn for when singers and dancers and actors are inhabiting our stages. But until that point, this is something very special to do. And, and it, it ends on a hopeful note, which I think is really important. Hopeful note. And it also it resonates for what we've just been through. That's Bec I mean, because it, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I don't, we didn't tell them. It's about blind, uh, a contagious it's about an epidemic of blindness. That's contagious. You just get close to someone and you can become blind. Right. I mean, it's, it's a horrible story. And it's about this doctor who gets blind from his patients and they all get quarantined. It's, it's an amazing yeah. story. What's yeah. so important about the story is that it's the power of community. When the community comes together, how they can get through something. And that's what resonates with people because of what we've all been through this mm -hmm. year. And the fact that there is the woman who leads everyone through it. It's kind of like this amazing guide, mother figure, guru person who takes us through. And basically that could be anyone in any of our lives right, who has our... helped us get through something and, and see the light, literally get through the darkness and see the light. Yeah. The, the doctor's wife in the story can actually, she doesn't lose her sight. She's the only one. And she pretends like she has uh, lost it so she can help everybody. help everybody. Yeah. So it's about community, really. It's a story about people coming together in a crisis. And th it's the resilience and the hope that stays alive until you get to that point, until you get through it, which is why it resonates with people right now. It was wonderful. I, we have some pictures from the production. Let's show it real quick. We have three pictures. This shows you that people being socially distanced and the lighting effects. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Daryl, thank you so much for bringing us the first Thank you. Play after the pandemic. It's it's really exciting to well, have. You know, it was important back. for me to try to open up the theater and put the people back to work, and also, you know, give hope, give hope, and and it's risky. I always say theater is risky no matter what, and so this was a risk well, really true. worth taking at this time. Now, did you anticipate the pandemic coming? Were you were you? I mean, you, you were working on stuff. What? Yeah. Yes, what were you working I, on? I didn't anticipate, like most people, I think this took us by surprise, totally, like a tsunami, actually. Um, but yes, when we were um, closed down in March, I had a wonderful play by Paula Vogel called How I Learned to Drive. Oh, wow. I had produced 22 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> yes. And we had this wonderful idea to do a reunion revival. I call mm. it the reunion revival because the idea is to have the same brilliant cast that we did 20 years ago. And that's Mary Louise Parker and David Morse. And I partnered with Manhattan Theatre Club, so we're doing it at the Friedman. Wow. So it will be a Broadway house Tony eligible. And so that was in rehearsal, deep into rehearsal. Now will, it, will it come back now? It will. We're so the, sure the stuff that you were working on before, will you be able to get them all back or not? Yes, over time. Yes. So How I Learned to Drive mm -hmm. will come back. Um, in London, we had a production of Indecent, Paula Vogel's mm -hmm, beautiful mm -hmm, play that mm -hmm. we did some years, a couple of years ago on Broadway. Unfortunately, that was closed down. We're not sure when it will come back, but hopefully it will. Oh. And I'm one of the many co-producers on Company, and we're very excited that that's coming back to Broadway. I think Patty Lapone, I heard. Patty Lapone <laughs> and uh, Katrina Lenk oh, wow. was our star in I Indecent. I loved her. She was terrific. That's right. So that will be back in oh. December. We were working on that. That had already had a preview or two. And the other show that I'm working on is a musical called Between the Lines. And it's- this a new show? On, it's a new musical, but we've been working on it for some years. Um, it's based on a book by Jody Pico, 
Jeff Calhoun's directing it. And we were about to start rehearsal, but had not. So we were lucky in that regard. And we'll pick it up probably again next summer. Not this coming summer, a year. Mm -hmm. And then the other things that are coming back to Broadway, I'm, I'm just so happy for everyone, you know? I, 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 it's wonderful. It feels really good to see the lights coming back on. That's what it is, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. Literally, the light is back. Mm -hmm. But you know, you have had such a storied career. It's mind-boggling. You've produced close to 100 plays, over 90 plays on Broadway or off-Broadway. I just want to list for the audience your uh, Pulitzer Prize winning plays. Nilo Cruz's Anna in the Tropics. Margaret Edson's Wit. That was a beautiful play. Paula Vogel's How I Learned to Drive. What a, yeah. I mean, that is such a powerful, coming back. powerful, powerful drama. Edward Albee's Three Tall Women. Mm -hmm. The production was unbelievable, the, the last production that you did. It was just mind boggling. Well, I just, I think the cast was so brilliant. Oh. You know, Marion Seldes, May She Rest in Peace, Myra Carter, Jordan Baker. Uh, and it was the play that brought Edward back to New York in a way mm -hmm. because a lot of his plays were being done in Europe and not as much in New York. This is 1994. Why really do you think like that, that was? You know, he was just, you know, he was working in Europe. He was not celebrated as he should be mm -hmm. in, in that time. But Three Tall Women um, in 1994 sort of brought him back into the limelight and started a glorious, glorious rebirth of his career. Mm -hmm. I'm, he's one of my favorite writers. Me too. Yeah, I, I love him. And I, I love The Goat. Oh, my God. I love and you the produced goat. it, too. We You're did produce The Goat. The Goat or Who is Sylvia? And um, that I was an interesting experience because, because of the subject, which you know I think we can say is bestiality. <laughs> we I didn't want to do an out-of-town tryout because we thought people would just talk about it in the wrong way, that we wanted to just open it in New York and have people experience the beauty of the story, because it wasn't about bestiality. It was about love right. outside of the box, so right. to speak. It was Edward talking about there are all kinds of love. And we didn't want people to just talk about the goat. We wanted them to talk about the beauty of the story. And so we opened it cold. Liz McCann and I, uh, who I worked with on all of the Edward Albee shows that we did, mm -hmm and starting with Three Tall Women and On to the Goat. That, that's one of my favorite plays. It is, I, I, really? I'm, I'm, um, because it was so shocking and surprising, yes. and yet it, what, what it was really about was not so shocking. That's right. That's a, that's a good way to put it. it. It had shock value, but, you know, much like The Normal Heart, which is another show that I'm so proud of having done the revival of in 2011, it's a shocking, horrible story, but it's the biggest love story that I've ever seen, ever read, ever produced. I mean, it's truly a love story. And I want to finish with your list of uh, okay. Pulitzer Prize winning <laughs> plays, because <laughs> we d digressed. Uh, there was uh, Bruce Norris's Clybourne Park. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Absolutely loved that one, too. Tracy Letts, August Osage. August Osage County. Oh, my God. That was a big one. Oh, my God. That was fabulous. I, I, and. Three hours just flew by, absolutely flew by. And then Proof. Proof I love so much. I'm interested to do a uh, revival of Proof. We've been talking to Kenny Leone about directing oh, it. Oh, wow. So it will be a diverse cast, and the story is a wonderful story. And we're hoping to do that in the coming year, I think is fair to say, in the mm -hmm. coming year. I'm so excited to do that. Well, when, you, when you produce all these shows, do you, do you meet? The actors, too, do you get to meet some of them sometimes? Well, auditioning them, for starters. Right, so did you, did you, like, I did an interview with Vanessa Redgrave. Did you get to meet her? Yes, because we did Year of Magical Thinking. That, that's what I'm asking. Yes, you. of course. And Cause I thought she was she brilliant, and she was charming, and, you know, she was just very gracious, extremely gracious. Uh, when we did Wit, you mentioned that years ago, Kathy Chalfont did oh. the first version of wit and then she was amazing and then judith light came in and took over the role 
an I opera didn't know that. Back to theater. That brought Judith back to theater. Which wow, I, I didn't know she. I didn't know she did that. She was brilliant, and um, yes, I, part of the joy of producing for me is is getting to know these brilliant, talented artists. You know, people don't understand that producing is not just gathering up the money and putting on a show. It's more creative than that if you consider yourself a creative producer which I do you are <laughs> you know I find the material and I put the creative team together I mean kinky boots for me was the biggest example of creative producing because it started with me seeing a little British film at Sundance mm -hmm. and taking it from that moment when I felt it could be musicalized and be a beautiful story about things I care about. Mm -hmm. That was a fabulous show, too. Yeah. It was just wonderful. Thank Another you. Tony Award winner, too. It was, <laughs> and it brought Cindy Lauper into the musical theater world because that was the first score that, that she uh, created for Broadway and was the first woman to, on her own, win a Tony for score and lyrics. She's dynamite. She's dynamite. <laughs> she really is. But that was an example of seeing something that could become something else. I love when that happens. I love when that happens. Well, that, I mean, because you saw from a little film where we could take this. Yeah. And you put together a team. Oh my God, there Harvey Firestein. Oh my God, and Cindy Lauper together at the same time doing something yeah. else. <laughs> and pulling each other's coat to make the thing get better and better. Well, and they work together so beautifully. You know, Harvey is a very generous soul and he's very collaborative as is uh, Jerry Mitchell, who choreographed. And everybody worked together just because they loved the material so much, and mm -hmm. it, became, it became such an important story for so many people that experienced it. You know, We had many, many young people come and tell us that it helped them become their true selves. You know, the story was about acceptance, accepting oneself mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, accepting mm -hmm. others. Uh, it was about a father-son relationship it was, it was about, about unconditional love, in a way. Hmm? It was about unconditional love that you had to it get to. It was about to unconditional love, about that, friendship. And so it just meant so much to so many people. And the fact that we were able to uh, give that gift, I feel. And it goes on and on. You know, it, it's playing in countries that you would be surprised to know. <laughs> Korea and Japan and South Africa had a production. You're kidding. Of Kinky Boots? Belgium. I, I'm thrilled. Australia was a great production, um, and it ran on Broadway for six years, so I feel very proud of that. It was a terrific show. Well, I, I, what, what do you think in your background prepared you to become a Broadway producer? What motivated you? How, could you? how would you like to answer that? Well, I would start by saying I loved theater as a young child. I was lucky enough to have parents who had uh, the means and loved musical theater particularly and so they took my sister and myself to see musicals we lived in new Did jersey you that's what your first show was um i don't remember what my very first show was we started off uh since we lived in new jersey we'd go to I the paper mill playhouse <laughs> really yes i meant to tell you that where earlier. where did you grow up west orange come on <laughs> so you must have gone to the paper mill playhouse also. i've been to the paper mill playhouse <laughs> so uh, when we but were my father young. brought me to broadway early yes <laughs> and ours and my parents did too and that's what started it for me i always thought it's so curious how does that happen how does that get put together i was always curious about the putting together of the it process and the magic of it all and how does it happen and that was it i just loved it and i grew up so it's just your natural family. instincts on wanting to figure out what makes things tick what makes things work mm -hmm. I, I thought it was magic and i wanted to understand it that. is magic but in my day there was no learning to be a producer i mean that was really first of all it came later for me i was in my 40s when i started producing. you remember your first show Wait, the first show well, was of course I do, Closer Than Ever. Absolutely, Richard Malvey and David Shire. And uh, I was asked to uh, join them at a club downtown called 88s, which no longer exists. It's 88 Piano Keys. I remember it. <laughs> it was a great show. And there were four talented people singing songs. And I said to Richard that evening, I think this could be a musical. It's it's so beautiful and the songs are all stories and I felt they were talking to me very personally many of the songs had to do with going through chapters in your life and doors closing and other doors opening and that's just where I was in my life and I said would you let me try to produce this I don't know how I had the confidence to say <laughs> that but I did 
And that was my first production. We went to Williamstown and we worked on it in that summer of 1988. And in 1989, we presented it at the Cherry Lane Theater. It ran for nine months, which I thought was very appropriate because it was the birth of my first theater baby. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started. And I must say that growing up, I loved theater so much, but I didn't necessarily see a role for myself. I wasn't talented as an actor, certainly not a director, not a designer. But I knew that there was something that would propel me somehow, some way later in life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was raising my family. My, my children are obviously grown now. But, um, you know, I would bring them to the theater with me all the time, Jordan in particular. And of course. Who's now <laughs> in, in theater, to say the Jordan least. is a major theater major player. Major theater player. <laughs> um, but he came Jordan with me Roth, to Jordan Roth, her, her son, is Jordan Roth, my son. Theaters. <laughs> and a wonderful producer in yes. his own right. But we uh, went to Williamstown together that summer in 1988. It was sort of like his summer camp. Oh, know. no. Yes, yes. David Shire was there with his young son. But he'd, he'd been experiencing theater all way before that. But was he was only like nine. Oh, at the time. So we, oh, oh, no, oh, oh no. Yeah, he was a little boy. Wow. But we loved it. And I'm happy to say that now one of my grandchildren is very interested in theater. She's a student at Yale. So I hope there's a little DNA that's traveling oh, please. through. please. <laughs> you know I, there is. I hope. But you asked me what propelled me. It was just a love and a passion. And I think that's the best way to enter any profession. You know, if you love it and you're passionate about it, and you'll be aware of the fact that you have to be tenacious. We, we believe it or not, we're almost out of time. We've, and we've only scratched the surface, because there's so much more I'd love to talk to you about, about all the things you've done. Will you please come back? It would be my and, pleasure. And we'll, we'll talk about, you know, my pleasure. things that are happening and then other things that have yes, passed. Yes, we'll catch up, because from now until September, so much will be brewing mm -hmm. in September. Things will so be blossoming. Let's hope, let's hope so. <laughs> well, we know, we know it will be fine. It will mm. be fine. I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic too, and I've, I've already been getting out. I've been to the theater. I've been seeing several things, and I loved your blindness. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming to do this, but thank you especially for bringing blindness to all of us. Thank you. It's, it's my a pleasure, pleasure to be with you. Ditto. <laughs> Thanks.